Book Three, Chapter Two of British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends, and Traditions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends, and Traditions by Ruth Sykes. Book Three, Chapter Two, Part One. Wearing mourning throughout Lent was formerly common in Wales. In Monmouthshire, Mothering Sunday, the visiting of parents on Mid-Lent Sunday, was observed in the last century, but is nowhere popular in Wales at present. Palm Sunday takes precedence among the Welsh and is very extensively and enthusiastically observed. The day is called Flowering Sunday, and its peculiar feature is strewing the graves of the dead with flowers. The custom reaches all classes and all parts of the principality. In the large towns, as Cardiff, many thousands of people gather at the graves. The custom is associated with the strewing of palms before Christ on his entry into Jerusalem, but was observed by the British Druids in celebration of the awakening life of the earth at this season. Part 2 In Pembrokeshire it was customary up to the close of the last century to walk barefoot to church on Good Friday, as had been done since times prior to the Reformation. The old people and the young joined in this custom, which they said was done so as not to disturb the earth. All business was suspended, and no horse nor cart was to be seen in the town. Hot cross buns also figured in a peculiar manner at this time. They were eaten in Tenby after the return from church. After having tied up a certain number in a bag, the folk hung them in the kitchen, where they remained till the next Good Friday for use as medicine. It was believed that persons laboring under any disease had only to eat a portion of a bun to be cured. The buns so preserved were used also as a panacea for all the diseases of domestic animals. They were further believed to be serviceable in frightening away goblins of an evil sort. That these buns are of Christian invention is the popular belief, and indeed this notion is not altogether exploded among the more intelligent classes. Their connection with the cross of the Savior is possible by adoption, as the early Christians adopted many pagan rites and customs, but that they date back to prehistoric times there is abundant testimony. Innumerable are the superstitious customs and beliefs associated with Good Friday. In Pembrokeshire there was a custom called making Christ's bed. A quantity of long reeds were gathered from the river and woven into the shape of a man. This effigy was then stretched on a wooden cross and laid in some retired field or garden and left there. The birth of a child on that day is very unlucky. Indeed, a birth on any Friday of the whole year is to be deprecated as a most unfortunate circumstance. Part 3. The bad odor in which Friday is everywhere held is naturally associated among Christians with the crucifixion, but this will not account for the existence of a like superstition regarding Friday among the Brahmins of India, nor for the prevalence of other lucky and unlucky days among both Aryan and Mongolian peoples. In the Middle Ages, Monday and Tuesday were unlucky days. A Welshman who lived some time in Russia tells me Monday is deemed a very unlucky day there, on which no business must be begun. In some English districts, Thursday is the unlucky day. In Norway, it is lucky especially for marrying. In South Wales, Friday is the fairies' day when they have special command over the weather, and it is their whim to make the weather on Friday differ from that of other days of the week. When the rest of the week is fair, Friday is apt to be rainy or cloudy, and when the weather is foul, Friday is apt to be more fair. The superstitious prejudice of the quarrymen in North Wales regarding Holy Thursday has been cited. It is not a reverential feeling, but a purely superstitious one, and has pervaded the district from ancient times. It has been supposed that Thursday was a sacred day among the Druids. There is a vulgar tradition, mentioned by Geraldus, that Snowdon Mountains are frequented by an eagle, which perches on a fatal stone on every Thursday and wets her beak upon it, expecting a battle to occur, upon which she may satiate her hunger with the carcasses of the slain. But the battle is ever deferred, and the stone has become almost perforated with the eagle sharpening her beak upon it. There may perhaps be a connection traced between these superstitions and the lightning god Thor, whose day Thursday was. Part 4 Easter is marked by some striking customs. It is deemed essential for one's well-being that some new article of dress shall be donned at this time, though it be nothing more than a new ribbon. This is also a Hampshire superstition. 
a servant of mine born in hampshire used always to say if you don't have on something new easter sunday the dogs will spit at you this custom is associated with easter baptism when a new life was assumed by the baptized clothed in righteousness as a garment a ceremony called lifting is peculiar to north wales on easter monday and tuesday on the monday bands of men go about with a chair and meeting a woman in the street compel her to sit and be lifted three times in the air amidst their cheers she is then invited to bestow a small compliment on her entertainers this performance is kept up till twelve o'clock when it ceases on easter tuesday the women take their turn and go about in like manner lifting the men it has been conjectured that in this custom an allusion to the resurrection is intended a custom the name of which is now lost was that the village bell should on easter eve and easter tuesday carry on her head a piece of chinaware of curious shape made expressly for this purpose and useless for any other it may be described as a circular crown of porcelain the points whereof were cups and candles the cups were solid details of the crown the candles were stuck with clay upon the spaces between the cups the cups were filled with a native beverage called bragrud and the candles were lighted to drink the liquor without burning yourself or the damsel at the candle was the difficulty involved in this performance a stanza was sung by the young woman's companions the last line of which was lest the maiden burn her forehead stuxio is a an easter monday custom observed from time immemorial in the town of abraconia and still practiced there in eighteen thirty five on easter sunday crowds of men and boys carrying wands of gorse went to pen Tuthil, and there proclaimed the laws and regulations of the following day they were to this effect all men under sixty to be up and out before six a m all under forty before four a m all under twenty to stay up all night penalty for disobedience the stocks the crier who delivered this proclamation was the man last married in the town previous to easter sunday other like rules were proclaimed amid loud cheers early next morning a party headed by a fife and drum patrolled the town with a cart in search of delinquents when one was discovered he was hauled from his bed and made to dress himself then put in the cart and dragged to the stocks his feet being secured therein he was duly lectured on the sin of laziness and of breaking the ancient law of the town by lying abed in violation thereof his right hand was then taken and he was asked a lot of absurd questions such as which do you like best the mistress or the maid which do you prefer ale or buttermilk if the gate of a field were open would you go through it or over the stile and the like his answers being received with derision his hand was smeared with mud and he was then released amid cheers this sport which would be impractical in a larger and less intimate community is continued with the greatest good humour until eight when the rest of the day is spent in playing ball at the castle part five ball playing against the walls of the church between hours of service was a fashion of easter which is within recollection it was also common on the sabbath day itself in many parishes in the days when descent was unknown and parishioners had long distances to traverse on a sunday and that too with the sanction of the clergyman and even his personal superintendents old people can remember such a state of things when the clergyman gave notice that the game must cease by putting the ball into his pocket and marched his young friends into church nowhere less than in a custom like this would the ordinary observer look for traditionary significance yet there is no doubt our easter eggs are but another surviving form of the same ancient rite before the reformation there was a church of england custom of playing ball in church of, at easter according to dr fosbrook the dean and clergy participating there were other sports and pastimes common alike to easter and to the sabbath day which are full of curious interest some of them no doubt arose out of the social exigencies of sparsely settled neighborhoods which caused people to remain at the church between services instead of returning to distant homes but a druidic origin seems necessary to account for others that the people should between services gather near the church to talk over the gossip of the day is natural enough and is a phenomenon which may still be witnessed in remote parts of the united states in st dogmal's parish pembrokeshire there is a tump which bears the name of canuck iseluth videlicet videlicet the tump of lies 
Here were men and women formerly in the habit of gathering together on the Lord's Day in great crowds, and entertaining each other with the inventing and telling of the most lying and wonderful yarns they could conjure up, with the aid of an imagination spurred to exercise by rivalry and applause. The custom is discontinued, but there is still hardly a neighborhood in Wales so rich in tales of fairies and other goblins. The custom of dancing in churchyards was common in many parts of the principality in the early part of this century. At Aberdui, Malkin saw a large yew tree in the churchyard under which as many as sixty couples had been seen dancing at once. The dancing was not in that part of the yard consecrated to the dead, but on the north side of the church where it was not the custom to bury. A tradition is preserved by Giraldus of a solemn festival dance which took place in the churchyard at St. Amalda's Church, Breckenshire, on that saint's day. The dance was led round the churchyard with a song, and succeeded by the dancers falling down in a trance, followed by a sort of religious frenzy. This is believed to have been a druidical rite, described on hearsay by Giraldus, and embellished by him with those pious inventions not uncommon in his day. One of the customs of Easter, at a comparatively recent period in Wales, was getting the children up early in the morning to see the sun dance. This exercise the sun was said to perform at rising on Easter day in honor of the rising of our Lord. The sun was sometimes aided in this performance by a bowl of clear water into which the youth must look to see the orb dance, as it would be dangerous to look directly on the sun while thus engaged. The religious dance of the ancient Druids is believed to exist in modern times in a round dance wherein the figures imitate the motions of the sun and moon. The ball playing in church mentioned above was also accompanied by dancing. Part 6. The first of April is in Welsh called Calan Ebril, and an April fool, a fool Ebril. The similarity of English and Welsh words may be said to typify the similarity of observance. The universality of this observance among Aryan peoples would certainly indicate an origin in a time preceding the dispersion of the human family over the world. The Druids, tradition says, celebrated the revival of nature's powers in a festival which culminated on the 1st of April in the most hilarious foolery. The Roman Saturnalia, or Feast of Fools, perpetuated the rite, though the purpose of the Christian revelry may quite possibly have been to ridicule the Druidic ceremonies. The festivities of May Day are in like manner associated with the powers of nature, whose vigor and productiveness were symbolized by the maypole round which village lads and lasses danced. The rites of love were variously celebrated at this time, and some of these customs locally have long survived the maypole itself. The ordinance for a destruction of maypoles in England and Wales, printed in 1644, declared them a heathenish vanity generally abused to superstition and wickedness. Wherefore it was ordained that they should be destroyed, and that no maypole should therefore be set up, erected, or suffered to be within this kingdom of England or dominion of Wales. The maypole in Wales was called Bedouin, because it was always made of birch bedou, a tree still associated with the gentler emotions. To give a lover a birchen branch is for a maiden to accept his addresses, to give him a colin or hazel the reverse. Games of various sorts were played around the Bedouin. The fame of a village depended on its not being stolen away, and parties were constantly on the alert to steal the Bedouin, a feat which, when accomplished, was celebrated with peculiar festivities. This rivalry for the possession of the Maypole was probably typical of the ancient idea that the first of May was the boundary day dividing the confines of winter and summer, when a fight took place between the powers of the air on the one hand striving to continue the reign of winter, and on the other to establish that of summer. Here may be cited the Mabinogai of Kiluk and Owen, where it speaks of the daughter of Ludla Reint. She was the most splendid maiden in the three islands of the mighty, and in the three islands adjacent, and for her does Guinap Nuth, the fairy king, fight every first of May till the day of doom. She was to have been the bride of Guthir, the son of Gridol, and the Guinap Nuth carried her off by force. The bereaved bridegroom followed, and there was a bloody struggle in which Guin was victorious, and which he signaled by an act of frightful cruelty. He slew an old warrior, took out his heart from his breast, and constrained the warrior's son to eat the heart of his father. When Arthur heard of this, he summoned up Guinapnuth before him, 
and deprived him of the fruits of his victory. But he condemned the two combatants to fight for the radiant maiden henceforth forever on every first of May till doomsday, the victor on that day to possess the maiden. Part 7 In the remote and primitive parish of Defenugh, in Breconshire, until a few years since, a custom survived by, of carrying the king of summer and the king of winter. Two boys were chosen to serve as the two kings, and were covered all over with a dress of brigaubedu, birchen boughs, only their faces remaining visible. A coin was tossed, and the boy chosen was the summer king. A crown of bright-hued ribbons was put on his head. Upon the other boy's head was placed a crown of holly to designate the winter king. Then a procession was formed, headed by two men with drawn swords to clear the way. Four men supported the summer king upon two poles, one under his knees and the other under his arms, and four others bore the winter king in a similar undignified posture. The procession passed round the village and to the farmhouses nearby, collecting largesse of coin or beer, winding up the perambulation at the churchyard. Here the boys were set free and received a dole for their services, the winter king getting less than the other. Another midday custom among the boys of that parish was to carry about a rod from which the bark had been partly peeled in a spiral form, and upon the top of which was set either a cock or a cross, the bears waking the echoes of the village with Yo-ho! 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 End of Book 3, Chapter 2